Okay, if you have a Bible or electronic device to read your Bible, I'd love for you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and obviously that is in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Pentateuch, or the fifth book of the law, and so it's the story of the children of Israel who have been out of Egypt, and they've been in the wilderness for 40 years, and they are about to go into what is now modern-day Israel, or back then was called the promised land. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 7. The Bible says, through the Lord, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. All right, so this is God giving encouragement to the children of Israel right before they enter into the promised land. Verse nine, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him, God saying, I found you in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness, but he encircled them, he instructed him, he kept them as the apple of his eye. How, how many are glad that God may have found you in a wasteland or wilderness, but because you're the apple of his eye, he brought you into his family? Isn't that good news? That's the gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus. But look at verse 11. He says, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. Now, there are about 35 different places in the Bible where God uses an eagle as a spiritual application or an illustration. Now, the most famous one that you probably have heard of is Isaiah 40, verse 31, that says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as as eagles. And so that's just one. But in these verses that we just read, the context is that, uh, th again, this is the children of Israel. They've been brought out from the land of Egypt, and they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. And they've been basically doing laps. Same, same, same. They've been in this cycle of sameness for a long time, but now things are getting ready to change. And they're going to enter into the promised land. In fact, they're on the cusp of the biggest changes that they've ever experienced. But they're also on the cusp of the biggest blessing that they would ever know in their lives. God is saying to us that there has to be change in us before there can be change around us. Let me say that again. I think God is saying through these verses that, that we have to embrace the change in us before the change can happen around us. Now look at these verses. He says, remember the days of old. He says, don't ever forget where you came from. You, I brought you out of Egypt. Don't ever forget that. And he says, the Lord's portion is his people. And I just want to remind you that God delights in doing great things for his people. Amen? He encircled them. He instructed them. He kept them as the apple of his eye. I think what God is saying to them, he says, listen, you guys, it's not enough. You can't live in the past. I've got more for you to do. You're about to possess everything that I've promised to you, and in order to possess it, you're going to experience major change. In fact, it'll be the most significant change that you've had in your life because the majority of people uh, in the children of Israel weren't even alive when they were in Egypt. And they were going to become, go from wanderers and pilgrims to a place of their own. And, and I think uh, in this story, God uses the illustration of an eagle and how it stirs up its nest as an illustration about change. Verse 11 says, as an eagle stirs up its nest, how it hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So God is the one who chose to use the, the change in the life of an eagle 
to illustrate change in the children of Israel. So let's break this down. How many know the eagle is a pretty amazing animal? Uh, You may not know that an eagle can fly up to 200 miles an hour. Imagine all those cars whipping around Indianapolis Motor Speedway at 200 plus miles an hour. That's how fast an eagle can fly. It, It can strike its prey with the force of a bullet shot out of a rifle. In fact, an eagle's talons are so strong that he can put his talon around a man's wrist and snap it in half. Scientists tell us that an eagle can read a newspaper print from two miles away. I'm not sure how that works. I mean, somebody takes a newspaper and walks two miles and says, hey, Mr. Eagle, can you tell us what this... I'm not sure how science works all the time. Do you? So uh, an eagle doesn't eat dead things. It only eats fresh meat. And an eagle can fly 20,000 feet, 30,000, even 40,000 feet high in the, in the air, which means an eagle can fly above any storm. Now, when an eagle builds its nest, uh, it can build its nest anywhere from 10,000, 11,000 feet in altitude, and they typically do it on a tall tree or on the edge of a cliff, which makes me glad I'm not an eagle because I'm afraid of heights. Uh, So an eagle tries to find the highest rim of a cliff or the peak uh, of of a tree that he can find because their nest weigh can weigh between one and two tons. And when an eagle builds its nest, it's built of sticks and branches and things like that, even thorns. But uh, when the mother eagle uh, finishes the nest, she'll line the nest with the fur of the animals that she's caught in grass and make it soft and comfortable for her young ones. Now, when the eagle has eaglets, the first part of the baby eagle's life is pretty nice because they're in this warm nest. They're fed and they're protected by their mother. The first part of life is easy and all the parents said amen. Every day the eagles, these little baby eagles, have nothing to do but chirp and eat because mama is bringing fresh meat every day. But then, as described in Deuteronomy here, there comes a time for change in the life of an eagle. There comes a time where the eagle has to get out of the nest to trust God and to go a little bit higher to reach their purpose in life, their potential in life, to trust God and learn to fly on its own. Verse 11 says, as the eagle stirs up its nest. So what that means is there comes a time when one day mama swoops down uh, on the nest and she's sitting on the edge of the nest and uh, she's looking a little different than she has in previous days. She hasn't quite looked this way before and the little eaglets might look up and say, it's me time. It's meal time. Where's the meat, mommy? But there's no meat. So the little eaglets get nervous. And all of at once, the mother eagle lets out a loud scream. (laughs) And it scares the eaglets to death, just like I just scared you. And so Mama Eagle starts to flap her wings and she starts stirring up the nest and she starts pulling away the grass and the fur from the nest and the little eagles are horrified because they don't know if Mama's going through a midlife crisis or what. And so what happens is the thorns and the thistles and the sticks start sticking those baby eagles and they become uncomfortable and the little eagles say, I never expected this today. Mama's having a bad day. Because up until this point, all they've ever known was mama landing on the nest and they had never seen beyond the nest because some eagle's nest can be as much as 50 feet deep. They don't know the world that's out there. They don't know the adventure, the excitement. They don't know what they were born to do just yet. And so now mama is hovering over them and stirring up the nest and She wants to show them that they have wings too. So she starts to communicate to them by flapping her wings and her cries, hey, it's time to get out of the nest. I think God was saying to Israel at this time, hey, it's time to get out of your comfort zone. The routine's gonna change. In the wilderness, I gave you manna every day like clockwork, but now you're gonna go a little higher and I'm gonna give you milk and honey. 
But in order to do that, God is saying, I'm gonna have to stir up the nest like a eagle stirs up its nest. How many know in order for us to grow, sometimes God's gotta get us out of our comfort zone? Is it just me? Right? Uh, There's always a danger as a Christian and sometimes as a church to get used to what's comfortable, to get used to what is easy. But can I tell you that if all you want is comfort and ease, you're not going to grow as a follower of Jesus. And you're not going to fulfill the purpose for which God has created you to be made. Because uh, a lot of times we don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to step out because we're afraid of the unknown. And, and so God has to do some stirring up the nest for us. Are you with me? Like that mama e- eagle, she hovers at the top of the nest and suddenly she reaches down in the nest, she grabs one of her little ones and brings it to the top of the nest and sets it right there on the edge and the little eagle goes, woo, what a view. And then Mama Eagle goes, and then the eagle said, and Mama Eagle, being the you know an eagle can fly up to two hundred miles an hour, she will swoop down before the big eagle smashes into the ground and catches that eagle. Because how many know with the Lord Jesus underneath are the everlasting arms of God? That is, that is good news. So she rescues the eagle, draws him back up to the nest, puts him on the ledge again, and drops him. And you know, she thinks it's like it's a roller coaster ride at King's Island or something. And again and again, and about the fifth or sixth time, the little eagle goes, There's a lesson to be learned here, and I'm going to learn it. I think mama wants me to try to fly. Mama Eagle taps the baby's eagle's wings and all of a sudden, the little eagle starts to fly. And she says, I can do what mama does. I'm giving my best to you today. I don't know if you guys are. (laughs) I just want you to pause for a second and realize there are some titles of this message that did not make the cut. I believe I can fly, did not make the cut, you know. (laughs) Fly like an eagle, didn't make the cut, and definitely not, you are the wind beneath my wings. The title of this message is, It's Time to Go a Little Higher. Can I tell you, I believe that when God disturbs our comfort zone, it's because he's getting ready to display his power. He's getting ready to tap into the potential that he has placed inside each one of us. That's how an eagle stirs up its nest so that little eagles can learn how to fly. I think God is saying to us as a church, I know he's saying to me as individually, that God is stirring up the nest so that we can go higher than we've ever been. Come on, somebody. Has anybody other than me experienced a, a stirring up of the nest in your own life? There's a, some uncomfortable ability. There's some, there's some sticks and some thorns that are kind of sticking you. And it seems like God, like, God, what's God's doing? Maybe he's stirring up the nest, getting you out of your comfort zone. Anybody raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me too. Can I tell you, if you walk with God for a very long time at all, you're going to come a time where he's going to bring forced change in your life. And the reason sometimes God has to force it is because we don't like change. Change isn't easy. We're perfectly happy with the way things are. That's what he was telling Israel. You can't be okay with doing laps in the desert. I'm gonna take you a little higher. Something comes in your life and knocks on your door that forces you to change. And at first we think this is bad, this is horrible, this is a, but then it turns out for our good. You learn to fly. You learn that there's more inside of you that God's placed inside of you than you thought you had. And so God uses this analogy uh, analogy of the life of an eagle to teach the children of Israel about the process of change and that the change you're about to experience is going to take you out of your comfort zone, but the result will be a promised land. This is good news. In Psalm 103 verse 5, the scripture says, he satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the what? Like the eagles. See, I think that just like the eagle analogy, I think God is renewing this church. I think God is bringing us into a new season as a church. 
And not just as a church, I think God is renewing many of you as well. But the reality is, it's coming with change. And change is hard. And change is uncomfortable. I think all of us would agree that the last three years have been especially hard on all of us. As a nation, as a church, and as individuals, we've experienced a lot of change in a short amount of time. And guess what? It's been forced change. Now, I'm not saying that God is behind all of it, but I am saying that the Lord is the Lord over all of it, and God can use that change for our good. And matter of fact, can I ask this question? Could it be that God is stirring up the nest in all of us so that we will trust him even more and go a little bit higher? I think our church has experienced a lot of change recently, uh, especially in the last 14 months or so. We experienced a lot of transition and change on our pastoral team. Uh, we, we've always had a great staff and great team, but in a period of 14 months, uh, we've had four of our pastors uh, go. I mean, they don't leave, they go, right? There's a difference. So at the end of today's service, we're going to be honoring Pastor Brian and Nicole, uh, who are going to be moving to Florida. They're actually leaving today and, uh, to be with their, their grandson. And so at the end of the service, we're going to honor them. There's a reception at the end of the service. But uh, in a period of 14 months, Four pastors, all with uh, years, decades of ministry experience, have uh, gone from our church. And I, I know some of you are asking the same question. What's going on? Well, let me tell you what's going on. God's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm feeling some sticks and some, you know, what, what, you know, this amazing team, this, what, you know, what's, what's going on? Some of you have been feeling it too. Could it be God is stirring up our nest? And what if the reason that he's doing all of this, and by the way, God is the one doing all of this, because all the transitions are healthy and good, and, and we thank God for that. But I think the reason that God is doing this is he's getting ready to do something in our church. I think there's some little eaglets about to be put on a ledge and you're going to learn to fly. But pastor, I'm not, but pastor, I'm not, but pastor. no, 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 no. It's time to go a little higher for all of us. I think uh, in the midst of all of this change that's happening God is sovereignly uh, building a, a new team, a different team, many of the same people, but new people. And it's this amazing mix of, of older seasoned leaders, people like David Hall, who've been a mega, uh, an executive pastor at three of the largest churches in the country. He's on our team. How did that happen? Well, because Pastor Wayne's so good looking and he's such a great leader. <laughs> Wrong. Greg Wallace joined our team a few months ago. Again, just amazing experience over production and, and things like that. But at the same time, the, the newer members of our team are 20-somethings and, and, and early 30s. And these are people that are young enough to be my kids. Some of them are my kids. <laughs> See, I think God is doing much more than changing our team I think he's changing our church. I think he's doing something new in this church. And I've had this sense in the spiritual realm for some time that there is, we are on the, on the edge, literally, of a new season, of, great, of a great move of God, a great harvest uh, of people. And, and, and it's not just me that's saying this. So many people, scores and scores of people have said, I, do you sense what God is doing in our church? I said, absolutely. I praise God for that. But how many know that comes with change? And I just want to talk just for a minute just about some of the changes that I see coming in our church. Is that okay? Uh, I, well, some of the changes that, that we're, we're making in our church, I, I think we just need to make more room in our services uh, for God to move, 
for the Holy Spirit to do his work. How many know the Holy Spirit can do it more in a moment than I can do in a thousand sermons? And so we're just making more, more room for that. I think we're gonna be making more of a focus on worship uh, as a church. How many know the first thing that the devil attacked in the Bible was, was worship of God. He tried to steal worship away from God. He wanted to be worshiped instead of God. He's still doing that, still trying to steal God's worship in us by getting us to focus on other things and our hearts to be on other things. But how many, and the reason the devil attacks worship because he knows if we become a worshiping people, that the Bible says that he will exchange the spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise and good things will begin to happen in our lives. So I want you to be ready. We're going to begin to just disciple everybody in the area of worship. What does the Bible say about worship? And how many know it's way more than just singing songs? It's a life of, of giving honor to the Lord. We're going to, we're going to focus um, way more on biblical literacy because the second thing that the enemy attacked, the first thing in the Garden of Eden was the Word of God. Did God really say and so uh, the word of God in everything, word of God in worship, word of God in our services in everything, and, and talking about how do we grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you the number one indicator, if you'll make it as a follower of Jesus, do you engage with the Bible on a regular basis? That's the reality. I'm talking about more investment in kids and students, because how many know kids and students were the most affected by the last three years? The pandemic has, has literally changed their world and changed their life. Scientists are saying that the last three years has literally rewired some of our kids' thinking. So what do we do as a church? We can't stand by and do nothing, so we actually have to give more time, more resources, more energy. We need the best of the best serving in those, let me rephrase that, because I think I said that a few weeks ago and the pastor said, you should say that differently. We, we need some great people in our kids' ministry looking forward to what God has in store. And one of the things that we're thinking about, I mean, Gen Z, the, the studies tell us that Gen Z, only 4% of them have a biblical worldview. 4% have a biblical worldview. They don't know the word of God. What we're seeing, I think, is, a, is the fallout from a generation that had no Sunday school. Among many other things. So I'm thinking thoughts like, what would happen if we planned at our church, let's say four to six years, you give us your child for four to six years. You know, like the Catholics say, you give us your child till they're eight, we'll make them Catholic for life. Anybody ever heard of that? What if we as a church had a plan from this to this, we're gonna take you through the Bible, right? What, what could that look like? And, and, with, our, and with our students, Think about middle school and high school students and the insanity that they are facing that you and I never had to face. And the pressure and the issues and anxiety and depression and all this kind of stuff. I'm telling you, we're already seeing significant growth in our youth ministry since Pastor Evan started. We're excited about that. But I'm talking about even more time and energy and developing and focusing on students. And, make, and, and parents, I just want to encourage you, let's make this a priority together. Let's make their spiritual development a priority together. Come on, somebody. Now, I think, I think that also means that as a church, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a little older than I used to be. But I'm not old. Now, when I was 27, when I started here, the people my age are like, those people are old. I don't think that anymore. I'm young, relatively. But I, I feel strongly that as a church, we need to intentionally involve younger leaders in our church. Um, I think we're seeing a move of God uh, and right now amongst our young adults. God's raising up some amazing young adult leaders in a church. You're gonna be hearing from some of them here in the future. Can I tell you, they're not the future of the church. They are the church and they're gonna help us lead into the next season. Somebody say amen. I think we need to have more human interaction in our services. Human beings, you know, that's what we are. Because I think the American church has far too long settled that I come to a building, I sit and watch, and then I leave. Listen, that is not how you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. God has called us to be a family. He's called us to be a family together. And so we just need to reject the isolation of our culture 
and actually do what God says to love one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to greet one another. All the one another's in the Bible, we need to do that together. I'm talking about more focus on personal evangelism and teaching you how to share your faith, unleashing the church into the marketplace. Because here's what I think. I think we're going to see more people give their lives to Jesus outside the building than inside the building in the next season. I believe that with all of my heart. And, And so... You know, as excited as I am about the future of the church and the season that God is bringing us into as a church, I'm deeply concerned about the condition of our world. If you're paying attention, our world is headed for trouble. You can talk to any member of the military and they will tell you that training in the military has changed. Because the war in Afghanistan and Iraq is scaling down, and we're moving from counterinsurgency training, and now the government is preparing our soldiers for large-scale combat. You can go home and Google LSCO, large-scale combat operations, and it's, it's there for everyone to see. It's not a secret. I was talking with Pastor Mark this week. He is a reserve chaplain, and we were talking about this, and he was saying that uh, initially the training for funerals for soldiers was, you know, one person. He goes, now we're having training. What does it look like to do a memorial for 100 soldiers at a time? I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm saying the government is preparing for a large-scale conflict in the world. And here's what I think. I think if and when this happens that we're going to see men and women run to Jesus quickly because they're going to be looking for the name of the Lord that's a strong tower and the righteous can run into it to be safe. And can I tell you, we can't wait till then to get ready. We got to get ready now. I need, I, listen to me, I need, I need uh, and I hope you feel the urgency in my spirit. The Holy Spirit is calling. It's time to unleash the church with, with your gifts, with your time, with your talent, with your experience. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's time to go a little higher. Back to the ego illustration. And some of you are saying, thank you very much. <laughs> Remember the scripture says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I want you to share with you how an eagle gets his youth renewed. Because the first stage of change is in an eagle's life is when the mother stirs up the nest. But then the second time that an eagle has to embrace change happens much later in life. Because the, the eagle has flown through lots of storms, experienced a lot of turbulence, and, and taken on a lot of predators, been doing a lot of hunting, and flown through currents and winds, been to high altitudes and places, and in other words, an eagle has done some great things. But after all these adventures, one day as the eagle gets older, their tail feathers start to wear out. And now when they dive bomb after their prey, their feathers make a whistling sound which alerts the animal on the ground and who runs away before it can be caught by the eagle. And as a result of that, the eagle's eating becomes scarce and they can quit flying and they begin to find a lower place to live where they can walk instead of fly. And over time, calcium begins to build up on their beaks because before this time, as an eagle would fly through a storm, the turbulence and the wind of that would keep the calcium off of their beaks. The resistance it faced kept it strong. Come on, somebody. There's a spiritual application there. But since they're walking in low places now, the calcium begins to form on their beak. And so the longer they stay on the ground, the more their feathers begin to fall out and the more their claws and talons become old and haggard. And they start to lose an appetite for fresh meat and they lose their desire to hunt. Tommy Barnett tells a story about a pastor who was preaching in the Smoky Mountains years ago, and he was doing a sermon a lot like this about the life of an eagle and the spiritual analogies of it. So after this service, there was a Native American guide who approached the pastor, and he said, Pastor, that was a great message about uh, the eagle, but why didn't you talk about the molting phase that an eagle goes through? You talked about the nest and, and and the eagle stirring up its nest so they can learn to fly, but there's another stage you need to know about. 
And the guide said, would you like to see what I'm talking about? And the pastor said, yes. And so he said, meet me in the next morning. I will show you how an eagle goes through the molting process. Pastor comes out early the next morning. The, the guide, they walk and walk all day long to a particular spot that he wants to show them. It's a very high place. And then when it was almost uh, evening, they had come to this place and the, and the guide said, look, there are 27 crosses. And the pastor said, why are there 27 crosses up all the way up here? And the guide said, uh, these were the eagles that were going through the molting process, but they didn't make it, and I buried them here. So he took them a little bit higher, and he took them to a remote area where there were five huge-looking birds, and the pastor said, what are these birds? And, and the guide said, these are actually eagles. And the pastor thought, they don't look like eagles. And so the guide goes over, picks up one of the birds, hands it to the pastor, said, here, I want you to hold the eagle. And the pastor said, no, I've heard how strong eagles are. They can snap your wrist. And the guide said, not this one. These eagles can't hurt anybody. He said, I want you to come up with me a little bit higher. So they climbed uh, away from the haggard-looking birds and started to look down upon them from a higher place. And they were waiting, waiting, waiting for almost an hour when suddenly another eagle appeared in the air looking down on the birds and then another and then another and then another. And suddenly one of the eagles dives down toward the uh, haggard-looking eagles on the ground. And the pastor thought that eagle is going to kill this old eagle. But as he approached, the eagle actually dropped fresh meat on the ground for these other eagles. And then another eagle did the same and another. He said to the guide, he said, what are these eagles doing? And the guide said, these eagles understand what these five birds are going through. They've gone through the molting process themselves. And but three of the eagles turned up their nose at the fresh meat and only two would eat. And so the guide got excited when he saw the two eagles beginning to eat. He's like, please eat, 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 eat. And the guide said to the pastor, come back in another month and I'll show you what happens next. And when he did that, he said, here's what happens in the molting phase of an eagle. Your feathers begin to fall out, but the time will have to come when the eagle will decide whether or not he's going to embrace the molting process and make a change. Because if he decides to go through the molting process, in order for that to happen, he has to pull out himself all of his remaining feathers. The guide said that would be the equivalent of you and me taking wire pliers and pulling out our fingernails. I mean, no, molting, being renewed, can be a painful process. God's the one who used the analogy of an eagle, not me. But there's an analogy that in a person's life, in a church's life, well, I think we have to embrace change. And sometimes that change is hard. But we've got to decide, are we going to live? Or are we going to die? Are we going to get a fresh breath from God? Are we going to step into a new season with a fresh vision? Or are we going to go a little higher? Or are we going to settle for what God has done in the past? But we're not going to take any more risks. We're not going to take steps of faith. And people, when we do that, we start talking about the good old days. And the rest of our life will be protecting what God has already given to us. And can I tell you that usually when this happens, that's when we become very cynical and critical and judgmental of other eagles who are going higher. I mean, no churches can get that way. People quit talking about people getting saved. And look at what God's done. Look at how God has delivered people. And we start talking about things that don't matter at all in the eternal perspective of things. And I think if we're not careful, if we don't embrace change, we can begin to plateau and begin to spiritually die. I think I'm talking to some people in this room that you've, you've been through some storms. You've battled some demons. And I just want to remind you, you're still here. You made it. You didn't quit. You didn't give up because God is a faithful God. And underneath are the everlasting arms of Jesus. Can anybody testify today that God's brought you through some stuff? But we can get tired and we can lose vision. We can lose strength. How many know that can happen to anyone in this building today? It can happen to all of us. But at, when that time comes, we have to make a choice. Am I going to lay down and die, or am I going to go a little bit higher? Are we going to allow God to do in us what needs to happen, 
or are we going to stay right here? See, the reality is nobody likes change. And, and, and the reason, because of that, some of, some of us were like, walk away. I don't want to be part of that. And they choose to walk in lower spaces. And instead of focusing on living things, we start to focus on dead things. Dead issues start to come out. The past starts to come up. Come on, somebody. We start complaining and criticizing, and we're negative about this and everybody. Are you hearing this today? We get jealous of other people and their ministries. Listen, the reality is, some of us are there right now. Back to the story. The preacher comes back to the mountainside with the guide, and he says, they come to that same clearing where they saw those 27 crosses, but now there are 30 The guide said, the three that you saw that wouldn't eat the fresh meat that the other eagles brought to them, they died. They didn't make it. But there are two eagles that made it through the molting process. He said, follow me. So they went up a little bit higher. And as they went up higher, they looked up at the highest peak, and there was this big eagle. It was standing on the highest peak. And he was just sitting there and looking over the horizon. You've seen the picture so many times. Did you know that the eagle is the only bird that can, uh, knows how to discern the different jet currents? And so they'll stand on a cliff and watch. And they won't so much fly as much as they will soar and learn to catch the wind and fly on the wind. Come on, somebody. There's a spiritual application there. Eagles learn to trust the Holy Spirit and fly on the wind of God as he comes underneath us to strengthen us. So they stood there and watched. The guide says, hey, that majestic looking eagle, look at him fly. He chose to eat. He chose to go through the painful process of change. And then suddenly that eagle began to mount up, stretched out his wings. And the guide said, listen, this eagle had pulled out all of his feathers. So now all of his feathers are brand new. His talons are strong. The eagle has changed The eagle has become brand new. The eagle's youth has been renewed. And he can fly higher than he's ever flown before. He can see farther than he's ever ever seen before. He's stronger than he's ever been before. He can fly faster than ever before because as the Bible says, I will renew your youth as the eagle. This... This is what God wants to do in all of us. This is what God wants to do in your life, in your family, in your walk with God. And yes, I think this is what God is doing in our church. See, I think if change is happening in your life, if you still have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying and you're committed to to staying connected to the word of God and to the body of Christ. And if you're willing to go through the process of change and you'll let God do a work inside of you, here's what's happening to many of you. You're gonna begin to mount up on wings as eagles. And you're gonna fly higher. Some of you are gonna pastor, I'm too old to fly. You know, listen, I think this is a word for a lot of people not just younger people. I think this is a word for older people. You've had a lot of experience. You've had a lot of stuff. you got a lot of stories and your best stories haven't even happened yet. It haven't even happened yet because God is doing a new thing in your life. How I many know, he says, remember the days of old. We started that out in Deuteronomy. Remember the days of old. I think as a church, how I many know, we have a lot to be grateful for. We look past on these many years that God has done through us and we say, thank you, Jesus. God has done some amazing things in our church. God has done miracles. Thousands of people have been saved. Millions of dollars given to mission. Lot disciples made, pastors sent out, missionaries sent out. What an amazing thing. We're grateful. But here's what I think. I think our best days are still yet to come. I think what we're about to see will be even better and more amazing and more powerful than anything that you and I have ever dreamed. Because we and I are entering into a season of the last days. 
where he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Come on, somebody. Is anybody here today ready to receive what God wants you to have? Would you extend your hands to the Lord like this? And I want you to look at me because I want you to turn it into a fist like this. And those fists represent change, pain, hurt, uncomfortableness. I had to say it slow, Kai, so I could say it. Tension, stress, anxiety. Instead of you holding on to it and trying to plow your way through it, what if you just did this? Lord, it's yours. Come on, would you pray that prayer? All the stuff, all the hard things, all the challenges, all the spiritual warfare, all the difficulties, all the changes, it's yours, Lord. Would you pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me about what to do in this message? Holy Spirit, I receive your hope for my life. I receive your hope for my future. I receive your hope for our church, for this world. You're working, and Lord, I want to be part of it. Would you just begin to pray, Lord, do in me what needs to be done so that I can fly higher than I've ever gone before. Lord, it's time for me to go a little bit higher. Forgive me for for running from it. Forgive me for resisting it. Lord, I embrace it. Create character in me. Create wisdom in me. Let your anointing rest upon me, Lord, for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, I don't want to trust and live on manna anymore. I want the milk and honey that comes from possessing all the promises of God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand to your feet if you would? I want you to read with me the declaration that is going to be on the screen. Let's come into agreement with God's word concerning what we've heard today. How many know when you align with God, your words with God's word, powerful things begin to happen. Make sure they're on the side screen so we can all say it together. Are you ready? Lord, today we remember the days of old and your faithfulness to all generations. You call us your portion and your people and that we are the place of your inheritance. You alone lead us and there are no false gods or idols among us. We embrace change as a necessary part of our journey, knowing that you want us to possess all you have promised. We choose not to dwell on past achievements, but to trust in your guidance as we soar to new heights of spiritual growth and impact. We will not fear the molting process, but rather embrace it as an opportunity for renewal. We commit to going higher, accepting God's changes in our lives, and trusting that these changes will lead us to greater purposes and blessings. We will seek spiritual revitalization and a fresh vision, ready to soar to new levels in our faith and service to God. And all God's people said, come on, give God praise if you receive his word today. Amen. Amen.